Some of us are writers. Some are designers, doctors. We're professional hustlers, passion-fueled, purpose-filled dreamers. But we don't introduce ourselves as taxpayers because that doesn't say much about us, right? We pay taxes because we have to. It can be tedious, complicated, and confusing. 182 hours lost every year doing this convoluted chore. It's crazy. We get it. We've been there. That's why we created Taxumo. Taxumo makes taxes easier for self-employed professionals, freelancers, and solo entrepreneurs like you. No more mind-boggling computations to think about. No more complicated forms to fill up. No more long lines to pay your taxes. Just sign up, complete your profile, put in your income and expenses, then click a few buttons. Done. We remind you how much to pay, when to pay, and what forms you need to submit. You can pay taxes anywhere. You can pay your taxes online or at a convenience store nearby, at the mall, or on your vacation, anywhere, anytime. You can add all your other companies and pay for your business's taxes. You can even delegate your account to someone else so they can do all the filling up and clicking for you. All while you track everything, wherever you may be. So go ahead, be a dreamer, be your best, focus more on your passion. We'll worry about your taxes. Ngayong pinabalot tayo ng dilim at pangamba. Sabay-sabay ang pagkatok ng mga tanong na. Kaya pa ba? Saan ba tayo pupunta? May pag-asa pa ba? Sa gitna ng lahat ng agam-agam, may mga bagay tayong muling natuklasan. Wala pa lang pagsubok ang makakatalo sa tatag ng ating nagkakaisang puso. Nananalig? Nagmamalasakit? Nagbabayanihan? Nagmamahal? <laughs> sa bayan? Sa kalikasan? Sa kalusugan? Sa pamilya? At sa kapwa? Hmm. Kaya anumang pagsubok ang kakaharapin? Umasang may magandang bukas para sa atin. At pagkatapos ng lahat ng ito, sama-sama tayong tatayo. tatayo. Oh! 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 Some of us are writers, some are designers, doctors. We're professional hustlers, passion-fueled, purpose-filled dreamers. But we don't introduce ourselves as taxpayers because that doesn't say much about us, right? We pay taxes because we have to. It can be tedious, complicated, and confusing. 182 hours lost every year doing this convoluted chore. It's crazy. We get it. We've been there. 
That's why we created TaxSumo. TaxSumo makes taxes easier for self-employed professionals, freelancers, and solo entrepreneurs like you. No more mind-boggling computations to think about. No more complicated forms to fill up. No more long lines to pay your taxes. Just sign up, complete your profile, put in your income and expenses, then click a few buttons. Done. We remind you how much to pay, when to pay, and what forms you need to submit. You can pay taxes anywhere. You can pay your taxes online or at a convenience store nearby, at the mall, or on your vacation, anywhere, anytime. You can add all your other companies and pay for your business's taxes. You can even delegate your account to someone else so they can do all the filling up and clicking for you. All while you track everything, wherever you may be. So go ahead, be a dreamer, be your best, focus more on your passion. We'll worry about your taxes. It all starts with you, your influence, how you use it, how far you'll take it. You can fuel a culture, a culture of innovation, world-changing solutions, and a digital revolution. One that can save lives and save the world we live in. Because in today's business, the goal is to go beyond. To move, not just to focus on I, but I will. And if you say I will now, then you've already won. You already own tomorrow. A tomorrow where working separately can bring us closer to family. Where the things we waste can turn into things of wonder. Where children have room and reason to grow up where every organization has a common goal, to do good, because we know better. So take on the challenge and ignite change. Use your influence, lead, inspire, and create beyond business. Remember, it all starts with you. Good afternoon and welcome once again to the Livable Cities Lab. I'm Guillermo Luz, Chairman of the Livable Cities Challenge, Chief Resilience Officer of the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation and Associate Director at Ayala Corporation. So welcome to our fifth Livable Cities Lab, brought to you by Livable Cities Challenge, the League of Cities of the Philippines in partnership with Globe Telecom. This series of webinars are designed to deliver information, knowledge, ideas, and insights for better solutions for your city. During this lockdown period, I'm sure many of you have taken to online shopping and delivery for some of your basic needs, whether it's takeout food, groceries, medicines, masks, shields, and personal care products. Some of you have also joined virtual meetings like this one or sought such services as education, online education, and telemedicine. You may also have done some online banking or paid some of your utility bills or online purchases using your phones or laptops. In other words, you've gone to digital. Wouldn't you love to do the same thing when it comes to your government transactions? Apply for permits, permits and licenses online, pay your fees online, pay your taxes online, renew your permits online. Skip the traffic, skip the lineup, best of all, skip the inconvenience and the hassle. This fifth Livable Cities Lab is all about that, GovTech. Technology for Government Transactions. The discussion will revolve around solutions for improving government service, purchasing and payment arrangements, sharing of information and doing business. The, te the technology is already available and makes all of this possible. We've assembled a panel of technical experts from the private sector and the government to share their solutions and initiatives on how cities can harness GovTech in their operations. So let me introduce our host and moderator today, uh, Ms. Ida Johnson. She's an expert in strategy, digital transformation, and corporate governance. Ida is the CEO and president of Opal Portfolio Investments, a company in charge of managing distressed assets and turning around businesses. She sits on various boards as independent director, including the boards of True Life UK, Surpass, and Seed in Technologies. She's also a fintech 
and governance and governance advocate, and presently a trustee of the Institute of Corporate Directors (ICD), FinTech PH, FinTech Alliance PH, and a committee member of Livable Cities Challenge, which brings this program together. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Ida Johnson. Ida, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the intro, Bill. Welcome everyone. I am Ida Chongson. I'll be your host and moderator for today. We would like to thank or give special thanks to GLOW for sponsoring this webinar. Before we start, here are some of the reminders. This session will be recorded. Copy of the recording of the webinar will be sent after the session. For those in the Zoom forum, questions may be asked through the Q&A chat box and will be answered during the open forum. This will be queued and reviewed by our staffers as well. For those who wish to get a certificate of participation, please do not forget to answer the feedback form at the end of the webinar. Reminder also that we are live on Facebook Leavable Cities Challenge page. In addition, we will be seeding poll questions to the audience during the webinar. And these poll questions are used for us to better interact with you. So for the first poll question, so we know where everyone is, um, where are you joining from? Kindly put up the poll question and kindly do click. Please pick one of the choices, Luzon, Metro Manila, Visayas, or Mindanao. I'll give you a couple of minutes to click that and we can get a poll result fairly quickly. Okay. Okay. Oh, there's, okay, we, there's no poll question. All right, so it's actually not popping up. Okay, let me just proceed with this then. We do though have quite a fair bit of uh, mayors with us. So uh, let me see, for our first presentation, it's my pleasure to introduce attorney Ira Paolo Pozon. Ira is a lawyer, business person, arbitrator, educator and consultant. He graduated master's in business administration from the other school, De La Salle University. I'm sorry, I'm from Ateneo. Juris doctor from Far Eastern University and master's of law in international commercial law with honors from the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. He is currently CEO of Caucus Inc, a consultancy firm based in Makati and is a chief of staff of the Anti-Red Tape Authority. Through his public policy, government relations work, Attorney Pozon has worked with legislators, lobbied for key legislation, such as the Ease of Doing Business Act, the Expanded Maternity Leave Act, and the new Corporation Code, among many others. To present e governance in the Philippines and Arthas initiatives. Please let us welcome attorney Ira Paulo Pozon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction. Let me just share the screen. I'll confirm you guys, you can all hear me clearly and um, you can see my screen. Attorney Ira, can you speak slightly louder, please? Hi, can you, good afternoon everyone. Can I confirm you can see my screen and you can hear me clearly? Hi everyone. Loud and clear, go ahead. Okay, Not thank clear, you. But Hi, your, your screen has not come on yet, uh, Ira. You should be seeing my title page for the slides. Uh, 
Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Ginger, for confirming. Good afternoon again, everyone. I'm attorney Ira Paolo Pozan. I'll be presenting on e-governance in the Philippines. Uh, very briefly, the uh, slide deck will talk about e-governance in a nutshell, the opportunities and challenges on e-governance in the Philippines, and current initiatives of the Anti-Red Tape Authority. Uh, in a nutshell again, e-governance is actually the the use of information technology, enhanced information exchange, and the integration of standalone systems, while in the current mindset, in the current um, age, 2020, it also includes digitization, data sharing, and the use of new technologies such as those prevalent in the fourth industrial Revol revolution. Using that, it actually enhances the work, provides additional services, and stronger interactions between government to citizen, government to business, government to government, and government to employees. The e-governance is actually a push towards innovation. It has resulted through various studies um, throughout the world, especially proven through uh, more developed economies. Um, increased economic competitiveness, increased GDP per capita, and the growth of the public sector output. The effect that's known as the Smith's effect says that e-governance programs increases the supply capacity of the public sector. John Peter's effect says that by enhancing the ICT of the public sector and giving it enough time to be implemented has proven the improvement of the public sector productivity leading to economic growth. Ricardo's effect says that um, by providing a decrease in the tech costs vis-a-vis -vis the labor costs, it's actually resulting in more efficient technology. And um, the Poisson's effect, this is actually an internal joke. The quote-unquote is a, uh, this has not yet been fully proven and I hope to publish on this, but through more efficient technology, we now have the opportunity for our labor force to reskill, to adjust to the technologies and to enhance their skill sets something I wrote about in the Asia Global Online of the University of Hong Kong last July. The drive to e-governance in the Philippines has been existing since the creation of ARTA in 2018, but has really been highlighted in the latest um, uh, State of the Nation address of the president, where he says, we need e-governance to provide our people with the services they need from the comfort of their homes and workplaces. In line with that, um, the, the anti red tape authority, so e-governance task force with the chairman as being Secretary Lopez of the DDI, co-chairman, Director General Bellica of the anti red tape authority and the representative members, the ICT, Department of Finance, the ILG, Peter Wallace as the private sector representative and the National Association of Business Permitting and Licensing Offices. Now, this is something I've been advocating even prior to joining ARTA, that it is time for us to really bring in more digital services and more automation. For two reasons, specifically, technology is both the disruptor and the enabler. And COVID-19 uh, has really pushed the need for e-governance. Technology today has actually reached a significant milestone where it takes much less time to achieve mass adoption, which is defined in business as 25% of market access. From what started as the airplane taking 68 years to reach 25%, all the way down to television taking 22 years, the PC took only 14 years, the internet only took seven years, the iPod three years, and the iPhone two and three quarters years. Facebook only took two years, again, to reach 25% market access. Twitter only took nine months. And perhaps um, further proving the point that everybody at least has a smartphone and has access to internet and, and all the digital capabilities. Angry Birds took only 35 days to reach 25% market access, while augmented reality pioneering game Pokemon Go only took 19 days. So you can really imagine the, the push towards um, gaining better market access because of the advantages of technology. Furthermore, with COVID-19 again, many uh, reports showed that cash is no longer king. In fact, 
the pandemic has really pushed the shift to e-wallets. And I'm glad to be invited here and to have um, Gcash with us on this webinar. Furthermore, and I'm very um, happy about this, I really congratulate my friends in the B Bureau of Internal Revenue. Their annual income tax returns for this year, despite all the difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic, really showed that they have adjusted and adopted the push towards e-governance. This year, they had 15,490 manually filed tax returns. These are still those paper copies that they brought to the regional district offices. And manual payments amounted to 10.82 billion pesos. While digitally, and it shows that they have not, they have accepted it, but also that the consumers, the taxpayers have adjusted to the e-governance system. 1.432 million e-filed tax returns amounting to 62.78 billion pesos in taxes through e-payment facilities. Here are the three issues or the three major concerns regarding e-governance in the country, especially those that are um, within the mandate of the Anti-Red Tape Authority. First is interconnectivity, second is data sharing, and third is the single window approach. With regards to interconnectivity, we've heard it before, the president even mentioned it in the State of the Nation address. Um, there have been significant governmental measures to address the problem. First of all, uh, Joint Memorandum Circular 1, Series of 2020, which is actually a multi-agency um, memorandum circular bringing together ARTA, the DICT, the local governments, um, all throughout. This is specifically targeted to streamlining the issuance of permits, licenses, and certificates for common cell towers. The second one is actually a memorandum circular issued by ARTA, which presents and provides recommended policy adjustments for reconstituting or reissuing licenses and permits under the new normal. And third, um, actually it was just very recently, the president signed the Bayanihan Act 2 which also further streamlines the permitting system for telecommunications towers. Now, from those guidelines, we have these key, um, key aspects that we're pushing for. Number one is to create a virtual one-stop shop. Number two, to enable government agencies, LGUs, and um, all uh, uh, instrumentalities and bodies to accept um, requirements for any permit license, franchise, certificate, electronically. To enable e-payment solutions. And we're really pushing for this. I'm happy to be one of the first people in art to have a digital signature. We are using the public key infrastructure system of the DICT. It is secure. It is, um, it is very efficient. And it is really just bringing our signatures beyond just scanning our signatures and putting it on a page. Um, in fact, the JMC that I mentioned earlier, the nine agency JMC was all signed digitally using the public key infrastructure of the DICT. We are also pushing for QR codes and partnerships with local cur courier service providers. If there has to be something that is undeliverable electronically, it should still be in the sense that the, cons the consumer, the customer, the citizen does not have to go to that government office. Um, we laud our LGU friends and partners. Um, number one that comes to mind is the city of Valenzuela, where a mayor's permit is applied online and you get your mayor's permit signed and it can be couriered to you. Data sharing has always been a point of contention among government agencies. Um, when we push for interagency communication, sharing of information and data, they often use the Data Privacy Act as an excuse or a, as a form of saying, I can't do that, I'm scared, I, have, I can be um, held responsible through the Data Privacy Act. We want to reiterate this over and over again. The Data Privacy Act protects data, but it does not restrict government from sharing it if the purpose is for proper regulation or governmental purpose. In fact, the National Privacy Commission, the body created by the Data Privacy Act, issued already two NPC circulars, 16-01 and 02, both issued on the 10th of October, 2016, 
to discuss this with um, the scope of government agencies. I'd like to highlight this provision that says, to facilitate performance of public functions or provision of a public service, government agencies may share or transfer personal data under its control or custody through to a third party as long as they have a data sharing agreement. In fact, the website of the National Privacy Commission has already um, pro forma data sharing agreements for anyone to follow or to adopt. And the single window approach, it is the single point of contact. We are trying to push for the revolution of how government interacts with the citizens uh, um, by creating a single point of contact, whether it's online or if, and again, I stress only if the government agency still requires that person to go to their offices, there's only one person that they have to talk to. And we're trying to integrate as many government services as possible into this single window approach. For our primary example here is what we launched in February, which is the Central Business Portal National Business One Stop Shop or CBP NBOS, um, where we really revolutionized and brought together all the business registration agencies from SEC, BIR, social agencies, SSS, PhilHealth, Pagibig, all to one place. And they were able to, the customers were able to register their corporations there instead of going to individual agencies, individual websites, make the different payments to different people. The single window approach is actually at the center of the one-stop shop model, which we're also pushing as well. I want to highlight the 2020 World Bank Doing Business Report. Actually, the Doing Business Report itself is the quantifiable way of proving that e-governance works. The 2020 business Doing Business Report is actually issued every year sorry, um, by the World Bank, and it really assesses 10 soon to be 11 in papers of the business life cycle. The, con the Philippines has been um, steadily improving. It, we started off at 124th, last year we were at 95th, and um, we're expecting even better performance once the report comes out this year. These are the indicators on the left-hand side and the scores. Now, I want to highlight here is the frontier economies are the ones that have really shown um, bringing digital, bringing government services digitally. New Zealand alone for starting a business will allow business registration from the benefit of using an app on your cell phone, for instance. Construction permits take significantly short times to assess and issue in Hong Kong really all because of the digitalization of government services. This is what the starting a business current process flow is in the Philippines. Again, this is before the central business portal. We start off, we have our articles of incorporation, we take it to an O3 public, submit it to the SEC, takes a few days, uh, open a bank account for the corporation, go to city hall, get the mayor's permits, PIR, bookstores actually for the, um, the tax books, you have to get your barangay permit, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go to the social agencies. 13 steps, we've counted it. It also takes around 33 days. And it's really just incredibly inefficient compared to other countries. That's why we created the Central Business Portal and we're working together with the DICT and other government agencies on this. It brings all of these business registration processes to the digital sphere create your account online, you're connected to the SEC registration system, you have a dashboard to show you where your applications are. You can, um, we're creating a unified application form so that you don't have to keep inter inputting every time um, when you're registering your corporation. The data will just be pushed to the relevant agencies so that your registration is more efficient. Your issuance, the, thin, the tax identification number is issued already you will have a digital order of payment and you soon we're hoping that we can have e-payments already on this. So through that digitization, what we were showing earlier was 13 steps and 33 days for national government agency registration will now be brought down to seven steps and five and a half days. So that really shows again, the effect 
of proper e-governance. And you would notice what I was trying to say earlier is we are removing the silo system of agencies operating on their own, but rather bringing them all together um, in a more unified manner. This is now going to be the process flow for registering a business. Go online, verify your corporate name, fill up the form. It goes to the Securities and Exchange Commission, who then issues your articles of incorporation. Then you, the CBP will push the data to the registered social agencies, the BIR. You go to the bookstore because this is something we're still working on is to create a way for the tax books to be, um, you, you don't have to take another step or another date to do. And the BIR, and finally, the local government unit. Seven days, seven steps, five and a half days. We hope, and this is something we've been working on before the Mikuli Shock, but we hope that the CBP is a prime example of what can be achieved through e-governance and digitization of government services. So I've already discussed this. Um, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, we have had to pause the further developments. It's been pushed a little bit further down. But we are now going to fully launch by November of this year. It will be a national um, integration already. So whether you're in the NCR or even across the country, you should be able to register your corporations online through the CBP. Other initiatives we're working on is an integrated business permit and licensing system or IBPLS. For the ASEAN single window, um, with regards to trading of goods and services, um, we are redeveloping the TradeNet portal in line with the DICT and the DOF. Creating the Philippine Business Data Bank, excuse me. This is a way for us to really be able to digitize governmental records, which are actually public records anyway. When you need information on a corporation, let's say um, how much they earned last year, you still have to go, you still have to try to get the filings um, with the SEC or with the BIR, et cetera. The Philippine Business Data Bank is geared to bring all of that online. And of course, a, now a standardized Philippine business number. What used to be where corporation had a business number with the SEC, has a different number with the BIR, SSS, Philip Pagibig, local government. That should now be um, unified. With specific reference to the LGUs, and I'm happy that uh, our very good friend, Attorney Malaya, is with us. She is the president of the National Business Association of Business Permits and Licensing Offices. There is a uh, a need to remind the LGUs that under the Ease of Doing Business Act, which was signed in May 20, um, 2018, the LGUs now have to set up an electronic business one-stop shop within three years from the effectivity of this act. I reiterate this because if this was made effective in 2018, three years hence would be 2021. This would bring... Um, Digitally, all those, the experiences now that when it's January, you have to renew your mayor's permit, your building permits, et cetera, et cetera. You're lining up in City Hall and it is really just a, an experience. And I'm happy that many LGUs are already going digital, um, especially Palanyake, which I, where I live. Recently, um, Arta actually um, reminded all these LGUs that the DICT has already prepared the IBPLS system. So it's actually the software that the LGUs can adopt to create their electronic business one-stop shops. Um, it is not something we are forcing, especially for the LGUs that al already have their own systems, but um, for those that may have um, financial difficulties, for instance, to create their own system wares. I'm reminding all the LGUs, this is already available. Um, I am conscious of time, so I'm going to end here. But really, our steps moving forward is to create a more comprehensive legislative framework for e-governance. We are we're already working on fast-tracking the streamlining efforts of the telecommunications industries. The national ID system is something we are really pushing um, because it is at the center of 
so many efforts of different economies and countries with regards to e-governance. For instance, what enables New Zealand to make their business registration online on an app in three hours is because of the national IDs that they have. So when I'm inputting, let's say, my name, my address, my birthday, um, you can actually just pull that from the system. And I don't have to keep inputting every time and for every other incorporator, et cetera. Uh, we, we need to engage the private sector and I'm very happy to have been invited here with the Livable Cities Challenge. Um, focusing on digital natives, we need to invest again on cybersecurity and data privacy protection and to develop interoperability between and among the government agencies. I don't want to take too much time, but if there are questions, I'll be ready and willing to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Attorney Ira. I am so looking forward to November. Um, in fact, I do have some samples as well that I can vouch that some of these things are already working. Um, I could think of lots of questions, one of them about the delay in the national ID, whether that will delay, but let's not answer that for now. Let's tackle that um, during the panel session. So before I introduce our next speakers, I'd like to remind everyone that if you do have questions, feel free to use the Q&A box or comment section of Facebook Live so we can answer them during the panel discussions later. For the next presentation, it is my pleasure to introduce attorney Melanie Malaya. Attorney Malaya is currently the president of the National Association of BPLO Chiefs in the Philippines and is currently the chief of the business permits and licensing office of the city government of Paranaque since 2013. Prior to joining the Paranaque city government, she was the chief BPLO of city government of Caloocan. Her initiative in implementing the Anti-Red Tape Act has earned Paranaque City an excellent rating from the Civil Service Commission and Bantay.ph. Moreover, Paranaque has been recognized both by the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Meralco Luminaries as one of the most business-friendly cities in the country today. She holds a bachelor degree in philosophy cum laude from UP Diliman, where she received the UP president's pin of graduating students with honors in 1995. She completed her law studies at the Ateneo de Manila School of Law, where she earned her Juris Doctor degree in 2001. She was admitted to the Philippine Bar in 2002 and immediately formed part of the Sanchez Malaya de Leon Law Partnership. To discuss the GovTech initiatives of NABPLO, I beg your pardon, NABPLO, and on the local government side, let us welcome Attorney Melanie Malaya. Thank you very much, uh, Ida. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, uh, thank our organizers, the Livable Cities uh, Forum, and of course, Mr. Uh, Bill Luz for this opportunity. And uh, also my co-panelists, uh, Attorney Ira, and uh, Ms. Ginger, Ms. Raquel, Ms. Teddy, and Ms. Uh, Janice. Okay, slides. Okay. Okay. So, uh, for my presentation, I'm going to discuss uh, promoting e-governance in uh, LGUs, the new, new digital normal. Uh, First, uh, I'll uh, discuss briefly uh, an introduction on the NABLO, or the National Association of Business Permits and Licensing Officers in the Philippines. Also on GovTech in the Philippines, uh, the best practices in e-governance uh, initiatives and uh, NABLO's immediate uh, priorities. So what is NABLO? 
NAPLO uh, was established, uh, the precursor is uh, the Metro Manila Permits and Licensing Officers. It was established in 1998 and was recently reorganized as the National Association of BPLOs. So it's now a uh, uh, nationwide organization of BPLOs. Our primary goal is to improve the business environment that is in, with, with respect to regulations and revenue collections by adopting a shared ideas and strategies and practices among the LGUs. Uh, the NAD Plus vision is to be a partner for change towards uh, local competitiveness and uh, national development. And uh, with this, the goals of NAD Plus is to uh, help and assist uh, our member LGUs in revenue generation and business regulation so as to fulfill their mandates under the local government code and other laws and regulations, to serve also as forum or venue for the sharing of best practices and information relevant to its members. Uh, every year we have our uh, NABLO convention and uh, last year, uh, Mr. Bill Luz was uh, one of our speakers and so is uh, attorney Ira uh, Pozon of uh, ARTA. Also, the NAPLO serve as the voice of the members in raising concerns and issues with the national government agencies and with the legislature. And also uh, to foster close and harmonious relationships between its members and business chambers, uh, both local and national. And uh, more importantly, uh, NAPLO wishes to uh, present itself as the national government's uh, dynamic partner in institute instituting reforms in governance as well as in fostering economic growth and countryside development. As what uh, was uh, said earlier by attorney uh, Pozon, the NAB law works uh, closely with the anti-red tape authority in the implementation of the, uh, anti, uh, of the ease of doing business law. Next. Uh, these are some of the activities of NABLO. Uh, let, let me check our uh, slides. Okay, so uh, these are some of our activities. Uh, we conduct uh, benchmarking, we conduct seminars to our members and the uh, sharing of uh, best practices. Okay, next slide, GovTech in the Philippines. With the passage of uh, the Ease of Doing Business Law in uh, 2018, which provides the framework to uh, promote government technology in the Philippines. No? As uh, discussed earlier, the Ease of Doing Business Law was enacted in 2018. So we only have uh, less than a year to uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to operationalize the, the, the mandates of the uh, anti-red, of the ease of doing business law. And uh, this, uh, the, uh, the NAB law has, uh, is very instrumental in uh, uh, guiding the cities and municipalities through our uh, uh, activities in automating their business uh, permitting and licensing system. Because uh, as uh, said earlier, we only have uh, less than a year to do this. Next. So uh, let's uh, have some uh, statistics uh, on the basic digital economy based on the population of the Philippines. And uh, here we have 4.5% of uh, the Filipinos have a mobile money account and 9.9% uh, make online purchases and uh, one point, only 1.9% 1 or less than 2% have a credit card while 34% has uh, an account with the financial institution. So, but you can see that uh, a lot of our population or 71% 
are active uh, internet users. And the 67 of our population are active mobile internet uh, users. And we spend uh, around an average uh, of 10 hours daily using the internet. So uh, how can we uh, use this uh, being internet heavy uh, Filipinos no, in the new digital normal? So uh, we can improve LGU, LGU delivery of services by uh, using uh, mobile based applications to aid business registration, such as online appointment and submission of requirements also to harmonize policy regulations and institutional reforms, uh, including the uh, stable internet connection. Also the digitization of processes, one-time assessment, one-time payment, and uh, the use of digital signature and eventually uh, the issuance of an e-permit. Also uh, the interconnectivity both at the local and uh, the national level. So as uh, NAPLO, uh, we have identified uh, three uh, LGUs who have uh, best practices in automation and uh, streamlining of their uh, uh, issuance and uh, processes. Of course, uh, we have uh, the Marikina City Online Business Portal and the Valenzuela City's uh, 3S Plus. And recently they launched the uh, PASPAS permit. No? But uh, I'll uh, discuss about Project ELO and Project ELO 2.0 and recently the Project ELO Online of the City of Paranaque, where I am the uh, uh, Chief of the Business Permits and Licensing Office. So about the, bus uh, about the Project ELO, in uh, May 2018, uh, right before the uh, enactment into law of RA 11032, the city of Paranaque has launched the Project Express Lane operation. And uh, in the Project Express Lane operation, the very heart of the uh, ease of doing business law, which is the integration of the permitting process, especially the barangay clearance, the issuance of barangay clearance, in, in the city of Paranaque, when you apply for a mayor's permit, you don't go to the barangay anymore because when you apply, the barangay permit is included in our application process. So it is applied, integrated in the payment and issued in the city of Paranaque. And uh, also uh, a year after we launched the uh, project uh, LO 2.0, ELO is an extra lane operation 2.0. Uh, in this uh, project, we, uh, we upgraded our system by introducing uh, the kiosk, a smart kiosk, wherein uh, the applicant can uh, apply through the use of a kiosk and assessment also is being issued uh, by the smart kiosk. So there's no more face-to-face uh, encounter with uh, the BPLO personnel. And uh, at the advent of COVID this year, uh, we launched a project Express Lane Operation Online. So in this Express Lane Operation Online, we now have an online appointment system. You just uh, go to our website and ask for an online appointment. This is, of course, to... Uh, prevent the uh, spread of the virus among the uh, employees and also to our clients. We also uh, have now the online application for a new business and the online assessment and payment. And uh, recently we have uh, entered into a memorandum of agreement with the uh, Carry. It's a local based uh, courier and delivery service and uh, our permits are now delivered through a courier. And uh, not only that, we also introduced the full concierge uh, process 
were in the carry rider when you when you book uh, through carry you can have your uh, applications uh, picked up by the rider you can have them papila papila so you don't need to go to the city hall to pay your uh, permits and the full circle is for the carry to deliver your uh, permits and all for a very reasonable price and uh, uh, this has prevented or at least lessened uh, the number of uh, clients in uh, our office because of this uh, courier and delivery service. And uh, also, although not uh, connected with the business permits, uh, since this is about uh, GovTech, the city of Paranaque has uh, issued a uh, uh, cash assistance. It's our local cash assistance. We gave out the 5,000 pesos to those families who have been left out by the uh, SAP, the SAP of the DSWD. But not only did we give uh, cash, but we also issued a an EMB card. So in the Langsha QR code, we actually gave out an EMB card for free. So as to uh, encourage uh, digital transactions to our uh, constituents. And also uh, because of this COVID, we anticipate uh, the new normal. We anticipated the new normal, and further uh, uh, on, uh, further assistance can be uh, given through the use of our EMB card. So uh, the project ELO, uh, the very core of the project ELO is that uh, it's a concierge type, meaning single window you only uh, transact or talk to one personnel and it's the personnel who brings the application to the back office. So it is not the applicant or the client who goes from office to office or from person to person. So you just talk to one person. Also, uh, we have a unified application form and checklist, a single checklist of requirements. So. Uh, what is required of the other departments like the excuse me the planning office the building official the city health office are all uh, contained in one single application form and the checklist for all offices already there so uh, you don't uh, go back and ask for oh we need this from the other department it's all contained in a single checklist also, uh, prior to the EBOS, no, we are collocated all uh, offices involved in the permitting process in the city of Paranaque are here in the seat in the BPLO. It includes the cashier and also uh, the Bureau of Fire Protection are here. So uh, all transactions are done uh, back office. Also, uh, as I've said earlier, the barangay clearance, no, you don't need to go to the barangay to apply. It is issued here, it is applied along with your mayor's permit and is issued here in the city hall. So we have uh, one assessment and one time payment and uh, simultaneous release of all clearances and permits. So when we give you the permit, not only do you get the mayor's permit, but you get the fire safety inspection clear, uh, certificate, you also get your uh, uh, barangay clearance, the sanitary permit, all the permits are there. And in our project ELO 2.0, we upgraded uh, our system to include the application tracker. While you are waiting outside in the lounge, you can see in the monitor where your application is. So you don't uh, while waiting, you don't go, go to a personnel and ask how, how is my application going? Because you can see there uh, where your application is, if it's already in the verification, in the uh, planning office or the building official or the Bureau of Fire. Also, we have the uh, documents digitized. So uh, when we need to uh, uh, retrieve uh, documents, uh, we just uh, click it and it's there, it's stored in our servers. No need for papers. 
and also the smart kiosk that I've uh, uh, said earlier. So here, uh, the project express lane operation, uh, you can see there's uh, only three steps, application, verification, and assessment, one-time payment, and the release of all uh, permits and certificates. So we have a one minute video about Project ELO. Okay, thank you. And the recently we have the uh, express lane operation online uh, where we will be having, we will be launching the uh, use of e-receipt and eventually uh, the issuance of e-permits. And of course, online payment through our uh, uh, partners. So if you wanna check, you can uh, visit our uh, website, uh, www.bplo.paranake.com or the paranakecity.ph. Okay, so there's our online appointment and we also have a chat box there. And uh, for transparency purposes for e-governance, our Paranya Cash, the list of beneficiaries for transparency purposes are, and accountability are uh, posted there. And also the sub-beneficiaries of the city of Paranaque, you can check there in our uh, website. Okay, for not loss uh, immediate priorities, uh, we are pushing for the uh, enactment of the BPLO bill because uh, as it is, uh, not all LGUs have a uh, BPLO department in their uh, in their uh, LGUs, no. So uh, we want this to be institutionalized, and uh, maybe with the help of our friends here, uh, we can uh, have this bill uh, enacted into law. And also, uh, we are pushing for uh, uh, the har uh, harmonization of procedures and requirements in business registration at the local and national level, standardize the business permitting process what you uh, experience in one city or in one LGU, it should be the same with the, another LGU or another city. And also the connection to the central business portal as uh, discussed by attorney Ira earlier. And uh, we are happy to note that the city of Paranaque is uh, one of the pilot LGUs in this uh, central business portal. And also uh, to develop and implement complementary business reforms such as use of digital signatures, EV6, e-permits, and uh, licenses. Uh, we in the city of Paranaque are on this track and uh, hopefully uh, after us, uh, other highly urbanized cities uh, will follow suit. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, you may visit our website, nagplofilippines.com. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Melanie. That's very good. I mean, these are all good, um, though what strikes me though is it appears that every municipalities and cities, they're actually implementing different systems. Um, we won't tackle that yet. We will tackle that later on, but I've seen part of your priorities in NAB PLO that um, you would wish for this to be uniform as I understand. Yes. Um, moving on, Attorney Melanie will tackle that during the panel session. Okay, um, all right, for our next speaker, it is my pleasure to introduce Ginger Arboleda. Ginger is the CEO of Manila Works, I think you Manila Workshops. 
an events company that focuses on creating learning events and content for aspiring entrepreneurs and freelancers. She is also the COO of Taksumo, a tech company with a system that automates the computation, filing, and payment of taxes of self-employed individuals, professionals, freelancers, and micro, small, medium enterprises. She is the blogger behind mommyginger.com. All of her businesses actually revolve around the mission of helping entrepreneurs start their own businesses and help them sustain it. She has been a speaker in various events where she talks about entrepreneurship, women empowerment, marketing, so social media, and even mommyhood. So I can relate to this. To discuss how we can transform LGU services through GovTech, let's please welcome Ginger. Okay, thank you, Ida. I'll just present my screen. And I will share it. So how are you, everybody? So I think I have a poll. Um, can we please share the poll with the attendees? There. So um, if you could kindly um, answer it, please. So I hope you see my screen. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Sir Bill Luz and his team for inviting me uh, to represent like the private sector. And also, I'm so honored to be part of this, um, the panelists. I learned so much from Attorney Ira and Attorney Malaya, and I'm looking forward to see the other presentations of the other guests today. So um, for this afternoon's discussion, um, we'd like to share some insights, findings, and the product that we hope could help the LGUs here who are attending this, this event, this forum. So um, in terms of what we can offer, um, I think what we can offer just to give you a bird's eye view is we can offer technical support. You'll see later on and as I discuss the product. Okay, so, but before that, um, I think Miss Ida did a good job of, of introducing me. So I would go through this. Uh, I would just like to say that um, I also am a taxpayer. So Taksumo really started because of the pain points that I felt as a, as a business owner. So one of my pain points was really going through the process of compliance and taxation years ago. So that was the reason why we started Taksumo. So I think we already have some answers here. Okay, all right. So let me go through Taksumo's missions. The reason why I started Taksumo together with my, my husband, who is our CEO and uh, our, our other co-founders is primarily because we wanted to help with two UN SDG goals. So one of the SDG goals that we want to help out with is number eight, which is decent work and economic growth. And we believe that once we help uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises in the Philippines sustain their businesses, they can get to generate a lot of job opportunities for people in the community. And another is to help with um, SDG goal number nine, which is obviously to introduce innovation and digital technology to the government offices. And we started with one of the most tedious, um, I think the most tedious process for a taxpayer in the country, which is obviously taxes. So just to give you an idea, a simple business in the Philippines uh, files at least eight complicated tax forms. The process is very tedious and time consuming for a simple taxpayer. Uh, according to a PWC report, it takes 182 hours uh, in terms of like preparing, filing, paying your taxes in the Philippines. And a lot of Filipinos are simply just overwhelmed you know, by, by the tax regulations. You want to get into business. You have this passion and this drive to start a business and to earn income, but then you're drowned by all of these regulations and compliance and procedures. So what did we do? So we created, um, this was launched, uh, we commercialized it way back in 2017. The company has been there since 2016. So this is our system. This is Taxumo. It is a web application, which is mobile responsive. So it works on your mobile phone. Um, it works on any browser. So it's browser based. The, the user will just input uh, taxumo.com in their, 
in their URL slot and then they can go to the to the system or to their dashboard. Okay, so how does it work? So the user simply enters their income and expenses and it automatically computes for their tax juice already. So uh, before when I had someone helping me out with my taxes, I would call that person two to three days before the tax deadline and he or she would say, um, you have 10,000 pesos that you need to pay. But as a taxpayer, sometimes, Shampra, you don't, uh, you miss out on these things and you realize that you don't have money for it. So you skip and miss deadlines and incur penalties. So with this, with every time you input your income and expenses, it automatically cal uh, calculates your tax juice already. And then one of the things that people don't like is filling out forms. So uh, the system easily and automatically fills out the forms for you. We send the data directly to BIR. Uh, by the way, we are an accredited tax service provider by the BIR. So we have certificates for that. So we, we really work with the BIR um, in terms of like sending data to them. And uh, you can pay via different platforms. So one of our partners is here, Gcash. So you can pay via different uh, channels. And also uh, one of the questions that the taxpayer usually ask is, paano naman the books of accounts or the manual books of accounts? How do I fill that up? So our system automatically generates uh, online or digital digital reports of books uh, books of accounts which you can use as uh, to get a loose leaf accreditation or if you have like just little entries or a few entries you can just easily copy it into your manual books of accounts so it's already uh, in a format that's easily uh, copyable uh, you can copy it to your books of accounts so we also use mach machine learning um taxumo can recommend based on the entries that you have given for for the past months it can recommend the best tax rate type for you in the six uh, for the coming year so we have that okay just to share with you so since our uh commercialization in 2017 we already have 30,000 users i think uh attorney ira reported a significant increase of people who really are now doing their taxes online. Uh, we have collected for the BIR around 24.7 million already in terms of tax collection. So let's now go to business registration. Um, in 2018, when we were analyzing the customer journey, so as a startup, we normally look at the customers, see their behaviors, see their habits. And what we've realized is that a lot of them, uh, the journey really starts during business registration. So what we did is obviously, since the processes are still manual, what we did is we offered our services to help them out with business registration. And from that experience, we're actually doing it until today. We currently have a partnership with Globe and we are um, encouraging people to register their businesses. Uh, at this current time, because we know that a lot of people are opening businesses. Um, so what the, what were the insights that we gathered? So one is they don't know where to start when, when it comes to uh, getting their business permit. Uh, I guess all of the steps confuse them. So a lot of them go to us and say, where do I begin? What are the forms that I need to fill out? Um, I want to pay taxes right away. But and then we tell them that you have to register first. So not a lot of people know that. Uh, that's why um, they incur penalties. And then another thing is they, when they're ready, we give them a whole folder of forms that they need to fill out and send it and send to us uh, with their all of their original copies. So they also ask us, I don't know how to fill out these forms. Can you guide us? So we have a dedicated customer service. Um, we have dedicated customer service representatives who actually help these taxpayers go through filling out the forms for business registration. And then the third thing is, if they do go to the government, different uh, municipal halls, barangays, government offices, they feel like they're wasting their time because they have to do it. And this has happened a lot. A lot of people go back and forth because they have to submit something. They feel, they realize that they don't have 
a document like one of our clients said that he needed a neighbor's consent so he had to go to his neighbors to have them fill it out so there are different processes in different uh, LGU so this has been sort of an inconvenient thing for for the taxpayers so what does ease of doing business really mean to our MSMEs, professionals, and even for you? I, I know there are mayors and government officials who are, who are watching this. So from the point of view of a taxpayer, a taxpayer, for them, ease of doing business is really they can apply for a business permit anytime, anywhere, and they can do it online. It's as simple as that. And for the government um, employees, no, they can assess documents faster. They can have like interagency uh, a system that can support interagency uh, approvals. And for the city, it's really to increase the number of the business permits because we know that we need funds for the government as well for your other projects to help people get through this pandemic. And also for PR, um, a big part of the relationship between us, the private sector and government is really transparency in the government. And we, we, you can basically earn our trust if things are very transparent. This is why we're push, pushing for innovation and everything to be digital. Okay, so this is our solution. As I mentioned, we are here to offer tech support. So this is for those, I, I commend the cities who are already doing this. We know that there are available systems as well, uh, but this is what we have to offer. So our system is called Easy Reg. So it's a platform where taxpayers can register and renew their businesses and transact with the municipal hall anytime, anywhere. So it's uh, for the taxpayer, uh, they can actually access it through their mobile phone. We're going to have a mobile app as well, and also a dashboard uh, if they prefer to use their laptops or computers. And it's a highly customable, uh, customizable system. It will show business applications, uh, accept online payments, uh, release permit approvals, track and monitor transactions. So all of the benefits, um, all of the things that I mentioned a while ago, we were trying to address it through this system. So I'll show you, I'll, I'll take you through some screenshots of the actual system. So business owners can apply and renew permits anytime, anywhere. So as you can see, this is a dashboard of your government, uh, of a government employee. They can see at any given time if a transaction has been completed or is in progress. The good thing also about uh, using Easy Reg is that uh, with obviously the consent of the taxpayer who has been paying taxes with Taxumo, we can easily integrate it for business renewal because I know like as an LGU, you uh, ask for the previous year's tax filings so they don't have to bring all of those tax forms already to your office. No, everything, we can integrate it obviously again with the consent of the taxpayer. And then uh, the app will help business owners understand the application process. So as you know, when you order, let's say, through Food Panda or through Lazada, you see uh, at any given point in time where your orders are, right? So in this case, the taxpayer will see at any given point in time what hasn't been completed. In this particular instance, you'll see that uh, there's fire safety, city engineering. So you'll each department will have their own access to the system. And uh, just to add to that, we also um, get the duration or the length of time for each of the uh, department's uh, processes. And also in terms of transparency, they get updates directly from the EBPLO. So you can uh, directly uh, contact the taxpayer and you can pay online and over the counter using different modes of payment. So we will take care of integrating with GCash or any other payment platform that you would like to use for, for this particular system. It's also highly customizable, as I mentioned. You can add features based on the direction or your plans for your LGU. So if you're dealing with, let's say, a contact tracing application or third-party provider, we can easily help you integrate with them. And also, uh, if you want to put news updates, news and updates for your constituents, we can also do that. 
So it really improves the productivity of the EBPLO and other licensing departments because this is basically your dashboard. So every day you can just check it and see what's pending from your end. And it also has analytics, uh, just like Taxumo, we have our analytics dashboard that helps LGs calibrate their processes. So this is an overview of the things that you can do using Easy Reg. Just to add to that, we have free and unlimited online training and onboarding for your staff in your LGU. We also have customer service online support for your taxpayers. So we teach them also how to use the system. Uh, we, ha we have our customer advocates, we call them a customer advocates, who are uh, on call from 9 a.m. to 12 midnight. So we can have that as well. And I think uh, attorney uh, mentioned a while ago that they had a partnership with a logistics partner. In this case, we can also, if you plan to do so and uh, plan to have that as well, we can help integrate with your chosen uh, third party logistics provider. So uh, that's it. So the cost of this, this is free. Uh, no out-of-pocket cost for the LGU. So if you're interested, uh, that ends my presentation. I'll be here for the Q&A. If you're interested, you can email Kevin at taxumo.com. He's the head of our government relations team, and he's also my co-founder. That's it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for that, Ginger. That's, that's very interesting. In fact, um, if I would grade um, the LGUs or the government institutions, it's really BIR who's actually needing help. And um, I'm hoping all this will be put in place. Though um, what strikes me is you are actually marketing to the city government um, and the municipalities. And uh, I was actually hoping, again, back to uniformity um, because some other municip municipalities may implement a different system. Um, no, but I, I do have some questions like, you know, what about the consumer? Um, how much will this cost for them and that sort of thing? But don't answer now um, because this is our, these are all connected with the discussions together with attorney Melanie and attorney Ira. So you thank you so it. much for that, Ginger. Okay, um, again, I'd like to inform everyone if you do have questions, although I'm seeing a few already, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A box and we'll answer them during the panel discussions later. Uh, to give more deep dive of GovTech of for payments and transactions, let's welcome Attorney Holazo. I beg your pardon. Attorney Hol Raquel is not even a, an attorney. Raquel yes. Holazo. <laughs> Raquel is currently, everyone's like an attorney here. Raquel is currently the cluster head, AVP, public sector and education from Mint, GCash. Prior to joining Mint, she was with Globe Telecom for eight years. Five years of her experience is with Platinum Relationship Management Group and three years with the enterprise group handling the top accounts of Globe Telecom. Telecom. Prior to handling the public sector and education industry, she has also had some background in handling BPO, IT, conglomerates, retail merchants, manpower, and manufacturing industries. She has extensive experience with different industries and account management. So the floor is yours, Rax. Thank you for the introduction, Ms. Ida. And thank you again to the Livable Cities team for um, inviting us here today. And yes, I am not a lawyer. I've been with the corporate team my entire career, actually with the Ayala group of companies, with Globe and then Gcash. So good afternoon again, everyone. I am Raquel Holazo, and I'm from the enterprise group of Mint. So Mint is the holdings company of Gcash and I'm heading the public sector and education industries. But before I start off with my presentation, may I ask the participants to answer the poll question being flashed on your screens. Um, if you have a mobile wallet or use mobile banking apps, if you could possibly have Gcash or Paymaya, Grab, uh, Discartec or any other mobile banking app, or are you the type to still prefer doing it the traditional way by using cash or going to a bank's branch. So I just wanted to get a feel on how familiar we are with e-wallets. 
or mobile wallets and how we are using it from this group. Okay. Let me give you a few seconds to enter that. Okay, so a lot of people are actually using Gcash. That's good to hear. Okay, now that we're done with the poll questions, let me proceed with my presentation on digitizing fund disbursements and payments collection, uh, driving financial inclusion through technology. So I think everyone can see my screen, my title page. It moving to the next one. Has it been moving or no? Let me just share my screen again. It's not moving from my end. There. Let me share with you briefly our story as Bit or Gcash. Our purpose is to enable the aspirations of the financially underserved. In the Philippines, there really is an urgent call to drive financial inclusion because tens of millions of Filipinos still lack access to basic financial services. 66% or two out of three Filipinos don't have bank accounts. 95% do not have credit cards or access to investments. And percent don't have any credit history where future financial transactions may actually be based on. This then leads to the proliferation of informal lenders or yung mga loan sharks who charge a monthly interest of 20% or about 400% per annum. And out of our 1,490 municipalities nationwide, 36% are without physical access to a bank. So madami po talaga sa ating mga kababayan yung kailangan pa nilang bumiyahin ng malayo at matagal para lang pumunta sa malapit na banko or pawn shop. So these numbers really show that there's a lack of access to financial services here in the Philippines. And we really want to drive financial inclusion. But on the other hand, uh, we see a big opportunity for growth here in the country in terms of mobile financial services. We have 124 million SIM subscriptions. We have more SIM cards out there actually than the population of the Philippines. I'm sure most of us here, we have two phones or SIM cards. And this was also mentioned earlier by Attorney Malaya in her presentation. The smartphone penetration in the Philippines is actually increasing. So out of 78 million mobile phone users, 65% have smartphones. And we have 76 million internet users, and this is growing rapidly as we are battling the COVID pandemic. So these factors make the Philippines ripe for digital financial inclusion. And our vision really is finance for all. And as mentioned earlier by Attorney Ira during his presentation, there really is a need for e-wallets and e-payments, especially now during the pandemic. So having said that, our vision is to create a cashless nation leading to finance for all. We want to be that lifestyle enabler with differentiated financial services. Just to give you a bit brief background on Mint, Mint used to be 100% owned by Globe, but in September 2017, we announced a partnership with Ant Financial under the Alibaba Group of Companies of Jack Ma and with Ayala Corporation to bring this dream of a cashless ecosystem or a cashless Philippines into fruition. So with Globe, uh, we get their nationwide reach and coverage to millions of mobile subscribers. And Financial or Alipay, on the other hand, they bring in their technology platform and expertise. And Ayala brings in their extensive commercial network, being one of the Philippines' largest conglomerates. So what is Gcash? Gcash is basically converting your mobile phone into an electronic wallet. And we are actually governed by the BSP. Now, the diagram on the right, in a nutshell, shows that we start off with inflows of funds into the Gcash wallet. And once you have funds in the wallet, then you can use it for funds transfers and payments and then move to the lifestyle aspect as well as offering financial services. So you can actually fund your wallet by cashing in via bank transfers. You just have to link up your bank account one time to Gcash via the app. 
or you can also go to our GCash partner outlets nationwide. Some logos um, are shown below on the lower left, like 7-Eleven, the pawn shops like Lillerica and Tambunting, or retail merchants like Pure Gold, SM, and Robinsons. And aside from that, we have remittances coming in from MoneyGram and Western Union. For freelancers, they usually use PayPal. And we also have what we call our PowerPay Plus Dispersion Platform, which is currently being used by over 900 partner companies and other institutions for either their payroll or other funds disbursements. Now, after you fund the wallet or cashing in, um, the diagram also shows the things that you can do with GCash. You can send money to any other GCash user for free. You can pay bills to over 400 plus billers. You can buy load at 5% rebate, even for other networks. And this actually remains our number one use case since 95% of Filipinos are on prepaid. And one of my favorite uses actually is being able to transfer funds to other bank accounts for free. You can also purchase from retail stores using our QR codes and even online merchants like Lazada and so much more. Aside from that, we do have our financial services, which differentiates us from other e-wallet service providers. We have what we call G-Credit, which gives you a revolving credit line up to 10,000 that you can use for bills and purchases. Um, our, uh, actually, our credit scoring method is based on your GCash usage. We've also partnered with CIMB. Um, they're a digital Malaysian bank for our G-Save. This is an in-app savings account that gives you an interest rate of 3.1% per annum. And sometimes um, we do have promos that gives you an, in, uh, an interest of up to 4.1, which is higher than the interest rates of traditional. We also partnered with Atram for our G-Invest. And for as low as 50 pesos, you can invest in the money market fund. So since the inception of Mint, uh, we have scaled to 23 million mobile users or registered users. And we see that our customer base is going to grow even more since we are telco agnostic, meaning even if you are on Smart or Sun, uh, you can register to GCash. We also have 75,000 merchant, uh, merchants na nationwide accepting GCash for payments acceptance. And we also have uh, 30,000 GCash partner outlets wherein you can cash in and cash out from. And as I've mentioned earlier, we have over 400 billers on the app for your convenience. And especially now during the COVID pandemic, we're seeing unprecedented so uh, GCash registrations have actually grown 3.5 times month on month versus pre-ECQ versus last February. So we see that we are really moving to a cashless society and more and more Filipinos are adapting to the digital lifestyle. So the digital lifestyle is becoming the trend nowadays. There's an increasing demand for digital and cashless solutions given current events with the global pandemic. And now is really the time for us to adapt, to change, and to go digital. So as we battle the pandemic, everybody had to iterate. Everybody had to pivot and to adapt quickly. Social distancing, wearing a mask and a face shield has become a must. Um, community quarantines were also imposed. Spending has actually shifted to basically the essentials. And LGUs and government agencies have been challenged in providing immediate aid and assistance to their constituents. So this has actually become our new normal. And GCash has been complementing the new normal, the stay-at-home lifestyle, with more users are using our financial services in the safety of their own homes. We provide relevant communication to encourage Filipinos to stay at home work from home, and do their financial transactions. Um, with our GCash for Good program also, which we launched, uh, it's the Fight COVID-19 Donation Drive, we were able to raise 27 million in donations to be shared across 18 NGOs and foundation using our payments acceptance platform. We have also been working on increased user adoption with the help of our partner merchants. So partner merchants have been posting their QRs on their social media sites, um, to accept online payments. There are new online businesses popping up via Facebook Messenger Marketplace or even by selling groups, opening up GCash accounts to accept payments and really just making it more convenient for the Filipino people. 
what is it that we can do together? We want to partner with LGUs and institutions to build a cashless city for our constituents by digitizing um, funds disbursement and payments acceptance through GCash efficiently, conveniently, and safely. So in times like this, we need to ensure the safety of our constituents and we need to practice social distancing. Uh, what if we can have contactless, contactless payments in the city or municipal halls when people apply or businesses apply for their business permits? Or we can have you as a biller in the GCash app so that your citizens can pay for their real property tax, for example, at the convenience of their own homes. And let us expand our reach to even the public schools, the hospitals, the tricycles, jeepneys, buses, retail merchants, you name it, by giving them a GCash for payments acceptance to prohibit and lessen the cash handling. Aside from that, we can utilize our funds disbursement platform to send out ayuda or financial aid or allowances to citizens with monthly stipends. So basically, we want to empower constituents for financial inclusion. We want to enable your citizens to have GCash accounts and encourage them to use it and start introducing them to a digital lifestyle. How can we do this? We start by enabling the LGU to have access to our portal where you can enroll your citizens, upload their KYC or know your customer details so that we can register them accounts. Or they can also do it uh, self-service through the GCash app, which just takes a few minutes. And, but if you use our platform, you may also disperse funds to them instead of manually distributing your financial aid or monthly stipends to seniors or scholars, for example, to city hall employees or through physical disbursement facilities. The GCash Power Pay Plus platform will enable the local government to quickly, efficiently, and safely provide these funds to your constituents. It reduces the risk of transmission, of course, of the disease as it limits physical contact among people. The citizens will also get this uh, real-time seeding, and once they have funds in their wallets, let's introduce them to a full suite of financial services. Uh, just to share with you, as shown on my screen, uh, Makati, one of our early adopters, used our platform for their Makatulong project wherein uh, they are giving 5,000 to 500,000 citizens. So from the first day or within 24 hours of the announcement of Mayora Abbey of the Makatulong project, they were able to distribute funds to 72,000 residents amounting to 364 million in financial aid. Uh, DSWD and LTFRB are also using GCash to digitally distribute SAP from the Bayanihan program. QC also used this for their Kalinang program, Kalinang QC program, where GCash was one of the payout options for their seniors, PWDs, etc. And the list actually keeps on growing as LGUs and NGAs have a need to send out funds quickly. And we would like to build that partnership with you as well. Another opportunity is we would like to optimize uh, the emerging opportunities for digital payments. So manual processing of payments should be a thing of the past. We really want to drive operational efficiency and reduce costs. And we want to make it more convenient and accessible to citizens. No need for them to travel to go to a physical location, um, keeping in mind operating hours, may hinahabol na closing, may hinahabol na cut off, lalo na ngayon na may COVID pandemic. And we're actually seeing that digital payments grew by 33%, with 7 out of 10 Filipinos now transacting through contactless payments. And with the increased usage and adoption, we can accelerate digital transformation by providing seamless and secure platforms for businesses and MSMEs and contribute to business growth. So quickly, how do we do that? Uh, so we want to enable the LGUs to accept payments via our GCash channels. We can do this via QR codes, uh, as we like to call it, scan pay, yung mga blue na key cards na nakikita nyo sa mga mo. Generate a unique QR code for you that you can either post online in your social media channels or have a physical key card if you have locations or offices that are open. The name of the institution will be displayed, of course, on the key card or in the app once scanned. And then SMS advisory is received by the one, by you and the one paying. Second option is to be a biller in app. And third would be uh, enablement 
of for online payment acceptance in your websites or in your app. This can either be for direct integration or through one of our online payment gateway partners. And payment actually goes straight to the nominated bank account of the institution uh, the next banking day. Next, ba next day transactions and settlement reports are also provided for accounting purposes, but both you and the one paying will get a real-time SMS confirmation for all the transactions. So my next slide just shows some sample execution executions we've done so far, um, payments, acceptance in uh, tricycles, todas, jodas, taxis, stores, kiosks, vendors, even big, big retail merchants, and sample government billers on the app. So just to summarize, uh, let us work together in enabling our kababayans for financial inclusion by enabling you, the local government units, and institutions to provide digital financial services to your constituents. Um, and in doing so, we empower them to live and breathe the digital lifestyle. And of course, to promote financial literacy. Um, and with that, I actually end my presentation. Should you have any inquiries and questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us through these channels. So we have our email support here, the website, and I also posted my email address and we will also be here for the panel later. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Rax. Um, that was really insightful. Um, you know what resonates to me is when you actually mentioned 23 million GCash users, I would love to see the demographics because where are they? I'm, I'm hoping some of them are really spread out in the provinces as well. And um, there's a point also in terms of that EKYC. I know one of the problem or one of the problems that's being mentioned is always um, not everyone has that ID to open the account. Uh, they have birth certificate. In fact, even some of them don't even have birth certificate. So um, again, not to answer at this point, um, but we'll tackle that later on. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. So for our uh, next and final presentation. We have Debbie Obias of Connectio Wi-Fi. Debbie has years of experience in Globe Telecom mobile business launching the first customizable and personalized postpaid plans via My Super Plan and Lifestyle Plan. Debbie has also helped Filipino entrepreneurs digitally transform their business or businesses by launching digital solutions for SMEs from Globe My Business, which is, by the way, a lot of the SMEs are still finding conversion from underground e-economy to um, digital transformation. So this is very useful. Debbie's new role as head of Connectio Wi-Fi is aimed at uplifting more lives of Filipino families by making broadband connectivity more available and accessible to the underserved communities. To join her in this presentation is Janice Rapan. Janice is the head of business development and marketing of Globe's Telecom Digital Solutions Group. Together with her team, they are major proponent that ensures public Wi-Fi is available in major locations of the country, working hand in hand with the LGUs schools, hospitals, transportations, hubs, major malls, and restaurant chains. To give more details on how Connectio can help kickstart GovTech in LGUs, please let's both welcome Debbie and followed by Janice. Thank you, Ida. Good afternoon, everyone. Before we start with the presentation, I would like to request the audience to answer this poll. Can you bring out the poll? Okay, on a scale of one to five, five being the highest and one lowest, how important is it to provide the DE communities access to fast and reliable internet inside their homes? So I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Okay. 
Okay, so majority, 82% said it's very important. And we know internet connectivity has really become a basic need among the Filipinos regardless of class. But reality is only 15% of the depopulation have internet or broadband inside their homes. And given this pandemic where everyone is really affected, whether you're rich or poor, it is now more important to provide this basic home internet access to these Filipinos to help them survive and thrive in this difficult situation. So our presentation will be in two parts. First, I will be presenting some insights on the DE market. So these are the people we serve. I will be presenting their needs, especially during this pandemic. And then the second part of our presentation will be presented by my colleague Janice. Um, she will tell us how we will serve these communities and address their needs by providing community Wi-Fi to this segment. So now let's look closely at the, our market. So who is the Filipino? What is happening to the Filipino today? So this is the ordinary Filipino. So before we all start with the solution, let's first paint a picture on what it is like in the in the um, in the situ in this situation today, this pandemic. Okay. So given the increase of COVID-19 cases in the Philippines, I think right now we are almost 270,000, so, and it's growing. So we are faced with a very challenging socioeconomic situation affecting majority of the Filipinos. So we see the economy shrinking. Last quarter, unemployment rate is highest on record. We see businesses closing down, small and medium businesses closing down. And 4 million students were not able to enroll for this coming school year. And total of 120,000 OFWs have been repatriated by the DFA as of August. And everyone is really on survival mode. But majority of our countrymen, especially those coming from the D segment, this survival mode is intensified. So as we enter this new normal brought about by the pandemic, most are affected by job loss. And, but you know, Filipinos are known to be very resilient, di ba yung mga kababayans natin? They really look for alternative sources of income so they are able to survive these trying times. So they really turn every situation around and take advantage of every opportunity to earn. So ito yung lalo sila nagsisipag. Sanay kasi sila sa hirap eh. So this is the, the DE segment. Um, they know if the situation calls for tightening of the belt. So they economize. They really focus on the essentials. Tapos they deprioritize the non-essentials. And they are known to be madiskarte, di ba? They would really grab any opportunity to earn and monetize their free time. So ang dami, ang dami sa kanila, they, they learn how to cook and bake. They sell them online. Some would become grab delivery drivers on side. And um, we see news, we have heard inspiring stories of some of these people using their ayuda to open up a business. So these are really good stories. And... Um, we really need to cultivate this because they really have this palaban attitude. So for this segment, um, they, they're used to making ends meet. Diba? They survive financial challenges even before. Uh, sanay silang lumaban sa hirap. Sanay silang bumangon. And they really do this for their family. This is for their kids. So they, they're able to have a better future. And... Um, some of them, when we interviewed, parang ayaw naman nila magkasakit eh. They, 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 but they really need to go out and work to provide for their family. So talagang they would really continue to fight for their livelihood. But in these trying times, how do we help them recover? And one of the things that will help them is internet connectivity. Kasi kung walang internet connectivity, actually wala lahat. Walang taksumo, walang, walang enabler. Uh, we can't digitize these segments. Majority of the Filipinos, but they usually view the internet as something for communication and entertainment before. So some use TikTok or even um, yeah, just Facebook. And for some, they would view it as a luxury given the tightening of their belts. But majority of them, now they realize that this is no longer a luxury. Because of this pandemic, internet has now become a necessity. Now more than ever... They need basic necessities within their reach. They need internet to uplift their lives. They need internet inside their homes to provide opportunities for livelihood, health and education. And it's really not just for themselves, but for every member of the household. So the challenge now is how do we provide internet access that is fast, stable, 
and affordable. So very critical affordability for this segment. And this is where Connect Tayo Wi-Fi comes in. So to serve the families in these underprivileged communities, so we've launched uh, Connect Tayo recently, and this aims to provide affordable Wi-Fi in every home, in every community. And this is how it works. So the customer they just needs to connect to the Connect Tayo hotspot, and then they just need to purchase a promo, and they can surf all day at a very affordable price. So to provide details on how it works, I'll turn you over to Janice, who will tell you more about it. Janice? Janice? Here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, Debbie. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, Bill. Thank you for inviting us here. Hi, Ida, Attorney Ira, Attorney Malaya, Rax, Ginger, and to everyone here in the forum. I'm Janice Rakpan, and I'm here to explain and um, discuss more about community Wi-Fi. But before that, sorry. But before that, let's go and see how we connect to the internet, the different ways of how we connect to the internet. Okay, I think everyone's familiar with this. Everyone connects through mobile data, through your mobile. It is through LTE and 4G, it's wireless. We have postpaid and prepaid. Postpaid meaning we have monthly service, uh, monthly packages, monthly service fees. And prepaid, you have a three-day, five-day, or a week package. Then we also have our broadband at home. We call it Globe at Home. This is powered by fiber optic cable and or DSL. It usually comes with a plan or a monthly service fee. Uh, this one, unlike um, mobile data, mobile data is available everywhere or anywhere. Globe at home is your data access at home. We also have the home prepaid Wi-Fi. It is also powered via LTE or 4G. It is wireless. If subscribers want to avail of this service, they have to purchase a modem or a router. And now we have our community Wi-Fi or Connect Tayo Wi-Fi. It is fast and reliable Wi-Fi technology. There's no device cash out because there's no need for any modem. There's no monthly service fee. And for as low as 15 pesos per day, people can already avail of internet access. This is actually your internet on demand. For mobile data, you use your phones, right, to connect directly. For Globe at Home, you need a router or a modem, and you connect to that Wi-Fi. Same as with the whole prepaid Wi-Fi. With Connect Tayo, wala. So how does this Connect Tayo Wi-Fi work? You see here, um, this is actually um, an actual deployment that we have in Visayas. What we have done is that we have installed the routers or your modems, but on carrier grid, on these poles. So these routers, we call it access points, are actually emitting Wi-Fi signal to the people in the community. Now, if the house is near to the pole or the access point, um, people inside the houses can actually get signal and people outside can also, of course, access, access this. So what, what happens? So when I access this network or not network um, SSID, the Connect Tile Wi-Fi portal comes out. So you connect to Connect Tile Wi-Fi. You simply look for the network name. Then the portal comes out. It will ask for your phone number. Simply enter your phone number. A code will be sent to you to verify your account. And then the packages will come out. There's a day, one day package, a three day package, a week package, a month package. And there you go, you have your internet, you can already surf. And if you run out of package, you can easily buy again 
And this is how easy this solution is or this access to internet is. Um, and what's really good about it is that it's open to all Wi-Fi enabled device. It's just like what uh, Rack said earlier, we are telco agnostic. So either you are a Sun subscriber, a Smart subscriber, Globe subscriber, TNT, TM, you can connect to connect tayo Wi-Fi. Our goal is to provide fast and reliable internet in communities where it is most relevant and needed. And we intend to deploy this in high dense communities and where internet connectivity is a luxury to have. So we want, again, what, how, um, just like how Debbie said it, we want to, uh, to provide affordable, low cost and reliable internet for these communities. We believe that this service is very important in these communities because of these three major reasons. One is access, internet access to uplift their lives. We see that internet gives more opportunities and hope for these communities. Also, in this time of pandemic, um, they are uh, they can access uh, the news for health and safety for the people in this community. Um, Internet connectivity also contributes to livelihood. Um, it is important now that there are other ways of um, earning, just like what Debbie said, Kanina, diba? There are a lot of people there who need to have more cash and then the palaban attitude. So internet connectivity is really important to them. Last, promoting education through internet connectivity. As we all know, children are not back into school. Therefore, online learning is very much um, encouraged. So um, having connect tayo Wi-Fi and an affordable internet can pursue this goal of this community to send their children back to school. So with that, we end our presentation with a very special video that we have prepared where you can see how Connectio uplifted the lives of the people in the community, how it contributed to its livelihood and promoted education for their children. So ngayon, sa Connectio, ang bawat bahay, may Wi-Fi na. Marami pong salamat. Every Filipino home deserves affordable internet, adequate resources, and access to opportunities. This is the driving force behind Kapit Wi-Fi, now called Connectio Wi-Fi. Together with community leaders, Connectio Wi-Fi focuses on areas where communities have the greatest need, education, health, livelihood, giving every student a chance to succeed. Dahil po sa Connect Tayo Wi-Fi, ay di ko na kailangan pang lumabas at pumunta sa mga computer shops para gawin ang aking mga assignments at projects. Lalo na ngayong pandemic, mas nakakatulong ito para sa aming online class. Enabling convenient access to critical health advice. Pinagamit ko po ang Connect Tayo Wi-Fi sa pag-update sa mga safety protocols na propose ng City Hall sa social media. Breaking Barriers to help create sustainable livelihoods. Bilang isang online seller, sobrang importante ang internet at connect tayo kasi dito, dito nakadepende ang paggasto sa araw-araw. Kailangan dumiskarte tapos limitado pa ang paggalaw dahil sa pandemic. Malaki ang tulong ng connect tayo wifi sa akin, lalo na ngayong may COVID. Sa pamamagitan ng internet, nagkaroon ako ng pagkakataon makabenta ng produkto ko. Malaking tulong ito sa amin, lalo na sa pantustos ng pang-araw-araw namin. Making a difference in the everyday lives of Filipino families and communities with low-cost and reliable internet. We are very happy with uh, the partnership that we have had with uh, GLOBE and we hope that uh, together with GLOBE, we will be able to bring Iloilo to the next level. So, pwede niyong asahan niyo kami sa GLOBE, tuloy-tuloy ang aming pag-develop, uh, pag-asama niyo kami sa pag-unilag ng community dito. 
Let's get every Filipino home connected. Together, we can make it happen. Thank you for that, Debbie and Jens. Um, we will now proceed to the last part and the most awaited section of this panel, which is the panel discussion. Um, may I please request for the panelists to please open your video at this point. May I call Attorney Ira Pozon, Chief of Staff, Anti-Red Tape Authority. Attorney Melanie Malaya, President, National Association of BPLO Chiefs in the Philippines. Ginger Arboleda, co-founder of Taxumo. Raquel Holazo, cluster head, AVP of Public Sector and Education of GCash and Mint. Debbie, of course, please uh, re remain. And of course, uh, Janice as well um, for the Connectayo. Um, we will be joined this time to be part of the panel. Mr. Bill Luz, the chairman of the Livable Cities Philippines, kindly open your video. Likewise, while you're doing that, may I just acknowledge uh, the presence of our mayors present in this webinar. We have Mayor Manuel Saladaga of Mayabag, Zamboanga del Sur. We have Mayor Maria Gina Lizares of Sipalay Negros Occidental, Mayor Lani Revilla, Bacoor Cavite, we have Mayor Roberto Jr. Oy um, of Liloy, Zamboanga del Norte, Mayor Lourdes Katakit of San Pedro Laguna, Mayor Arlene Arcilias of Santa Rosa Laguna, Mayor Erickson Singson of Candon, Ilocosur, Mayor Richard Gomez of Ormoc, Leyte, Mayor Crisel Lagman of Tabaco Albay, Mayor Andrea Inares of Antipolo Rizal, Mayor Francis Frederick Palanca of Victorious Negros Occidental, Mayor Arturo Robes of San Jose del Monte Bulacan, Mayor Noel Rostal of Legazpi Albay, and Mayor Maria, I beg your pardon, Vice Mayor Rosario, Maria Rosario Nitze of San Fernando La Union. So if the mayors would do have a question, please do put your hands up. Um, we can open your mic with your questions. Uh, but for now, let's first start with intriguing question. I'm gonna start with attorney Ira and this can be answered also by attorney Malaya. Okay, and this is with regards to the November deadline where is this highly dependable on the national ID is one question. And the next question is, why don't we have uniformity in terms of the systems of the cities and municipalities? Attorney Ira? Um, with regards to the uniformity, that's something we're trying to address as well. Uh, the current governmental situation is pro actually provides a lot of autonomy to LGUs. Um, for instance, one major issue is uh, with a single city, you can have different fee structures for permits for different types of businesses all within one city. And barangays have the autonomy to actually have their own fees. So that's one thing we helped Quezon City with was actually to bring together the barangays, try to streamline those fee structures in line with... Um, the, the proper standards classifications because you would have business types of across talaga. so that is essential for you to actually empower and to really fully utilize the ease of doing business law which says that 
um, for barangay permits, it has to be processed, accepted, processed, and issued on the city level. So when I'm applying for a business, whether it's barangay A or barangay B, if I'm in this city, I still apply for it with City Hall and I get it from City Hall. But the first thing we, that's again, the first problem we came up with was, paano natin gagawin yun kung ibang makakaiba yung fees? So that's one of the major things we're working on as well. That's just the first um, issue on uniformity. Second, um, we are pushing and we're working with a lot of agencies and a lot of uh, LGUs also to have a uniformity in terms of their forms, their application forms. Not just because one thing looks different than the other, but rather it's essential for the data to be useful. If you try to bring the data to a portal and let's say my city, the form starts with Mr., Miss, Mrs., Attorney, Doctor, whatever, so title, while another city's form is actually last name first or, or surname, you're going to have differences with the data and it's going to be a hodgepodge, really a jumbled set of data that's going to be useless later on. So that's another thing we're working on. Um, but to answer your question, it's, it's something we're, we're dealing with as we go along. We're also constrained by the governmental situations. The constitution provides a lot of autonomy for LGUs. So we're just bringing them to the table and trying to get them to streamline and to be on the same page. I see. I guess as long as they follow the 3720, the systems would be up to them at this point. The 3720 is three for simple, seven for medium, 20 for complex, number of days completion. Okay, um, any addition to that? Yes, that's Mariana? actually under the law. I'm sorry, go ahead, yes. No, sorry, that, that's just a, uh, um, it's provided for under the ease of doing business law. So the, what we're getting government agencies to do now under a different department of ARTA is to classify your transactions. Um, three days for simple transactions, seven days for more complex, 20 days for highly technical. And those highly technical transactions are those that involve public health or public safety. Um, we're also reminding these agencies and these LGUs na don't, naman ano, don't say that everything is uh, highly technical because that's still going to contravene the law and we'll still have to hound you to properly classify it as well as there are um, uh, that department under ARTA, the Compliance Monitoring and Evaluation Office is also in charge of receiving the citizens charters of all these agencies, all these LGUs, all these state universities and colleges in order to ensure that they are number one, they've updated the citizens charter and number two, that it's compliant with the ease of doing business law. Thank you, Attorney Ira. Attorney Melanie, would you like to add to that? Yes, uh, with respect to the difference in uh, fees and taxes, right? The local government code because it provides for uh, uh, schedule of fees for municipalities and for cities. And there's a provision there that if you're a city, the rates provided in the LGC, you can adjust it to uh, at most 50% from what is, uh, re uh, what is provided for in the local government code. And also because of local autonomy, no? Each uh, LGU has its own ordinances, has its own regulation. They can issue their regulations. So that's why uh, LGUs have different uh, procedures and fees. Right. Is the ELO specifically only for Paranaque while you're there, Attorney Melanie? Yes, yes, Eva. So, um, it's uh, for Paranaque yeah. only. Right. That's Being the president uh, of the NAPLO, uh, I suppose you would be recommending similar structure because it is working yeah. and it seems to be best practices, right? And, and yes, this is yes, a good I would do. And, uh, yeah, we have been benchmarked by uh, a lot of LGUs, no, as far as Mandawi City, uh, in Batangas, in Ilocos. So uh, they uh, came here in uh, Paranaque and we showed them our process and our uh, system. And also we share with them the templates, the ordinances that uh, we had in, uh, uh, in this uh, project express lane operation. So that's how uh, the NABLO uh, works. No, We help right. our uh, uh, other LGUs. All members of the LGUs actually, they, they do have representative in the NABLO? Yes, yes. So since this is a national organization, uh, the BPLO chiefs of each LGU 
Uh, but uh, as of now, since uh, we just went national uh, three, uh, three, four years ago, not all are, are already members. No? So our penetration may be 60, 70 percent are uh, members of NAPLO. So there are right, still some are. LGUs. Uh, which are, are not they required uh, to be a member or are they uh, not really uh, but uh, it has a lot of benefits to be yep. a member of their information and yeah yep, certainly um okay if i may uh, move on there are a lot of questions um actually some of them in the q a but i'll read it read them later my next question is actually for mr Belus. you know we we have these livable cities and we've been doing this this is our fourth um, wondering for this uh, particular one, um, are we also doing in our dashboard for every cities how they are complying with the requirement under the ARTA? So is that something that um, it's in the works, Mr. Bill? Yeah, that, that's a good suggestion, actually. Um, we had been looking at ways of measuring performance of LGUs across certain processes, but I think maybe we should team up with attorney Ira and the ARTA team on, um, on having a report card. Uh, for instance, I would like to see how many are, are using an electronic payment system or are using a digital transaction system for a uh, business permit or construction permit, um, you know, uh, such that using some of the examples, citing some of the examples that we have seen today, Paranaque, Taxumo and others. And uh, if we could get others to emulate them, and make it public, then uh, people will want to copy. So yeah, I think so. And I, I think we should team up with uh, Arta and create that report card. Thank you, Bill. Um, you know, a lot of the questions are actually related to Attorney Ira, but I'm gonna spread this out a bit because, um, okay, one of the question earlier on is on Taksumo, but it's no longer there. And this, is, this was from, um, uh, <coughs> Oh, I just lost it. The renowned architect. If we can have that question up. While I'm looking for that question, again, to the Taksumo. Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, how do we... Um, okay, in a matter of costing, um, if you're open to actually mention about the costing, um, you have two sets of clients. You have the LGUs to help out in their systems, and you have the private sector. Yeah. Um, how are you in the costing? And I'm actually wondering if this is such a good um, application or process. Why aren't we making it again back to uniformity? Make the BIR, lack of a better word, impose this so it can be used by the LGUs. Go ahead. Uh yeah, so Ms. Ida, um, yeah, I, I think I saw that question a while ago and I answered it. Um, uh, for, for, what, uh, for this particular system, Easy Ridge, um, this is a new system. This is a new product that we're rolling out. For the past year, we did customer validation. So um, for a startup to create a product, we normally go through the process of really asking first our end users what they want. So I guess this is this is something that we uh, um, we pride ourselves uh, ourselves with. No, it's really just knowing our customers. So um, we did some validation, and in terms of the cost, it's really like what Attorney Ira said. It's it's very different per LGU, and and I think Attorney Malaya knows this. It's very different. So. Um, that is why our system is customizable because it really depends on how the LGU envisions their uh, business model to be. So we're open to like a fee structure where we do fee sharing. Uh, we're also open to like a minimal, uh, minimal setup fee. So it really depends on the discussions with the LGU moving forward. But what, what, what we're seeing is really they're looking at a fee sharing model because we obviously we need to sustain this business. Taksumo is a business. And aside from the things that Attorney Malaya mentioned uh, that are existing in the environment, in the ecosystem, we provide customer service and customer support as well to the end user. Because what um, one of the huge insights that we got is that even if an LGO, uh, an LGU rolls out a system, the end user doesn't know how to use the system or they need guidance at least and support. So this is what we can offer 
uh, the LGU. So in terms of, for example, there are existing uh, LGUs with existing systems. If they just want a portion of what I presented a while ago, for example, they just need the customer service portion, then we can offer that. Or they need just the integration with a logistics provider, we can offer that. So um, our system is very modularized uh, in a way. So they can choose whatever part of the system that they want to implement and we can discuss that so would you mind how many uh, cities so far are your clients uh to tell you honestly uh we just rolled this out so we are in discussion with one lgu right now but i'm not in the liberty to disclose yet uh but in terms of the beta testing and the validation we've done this with 200 customers already so uh, there. So that's how we got the insights and that's how we envisioned the processes for this particular product. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to segue a bit to Gcash, um, which is an observation uh, when it comes to opening accounts. Um, it's really problematic in some areas. I did mention about your 23 million users, the demographics, and I bet a lot of them are not or, uh, or more into the um, urban areas rather, rather than the rural areas. In the rural areas, you would find a lot of people still not having identification. How do you solve this? How do you tackle this? And in fact, how do we tackle it as a nation? And that would be for attorney Arya, but um, go ahead. Um, you know, who handled, was it Rax? Rax, yes. yes. Okay, so in terms of KYC, we do understand that uh, in the app, well, you can do your KYC in the GCash app, but uh, with that, it's only six valid IDs accepted, UMID, voters, pill hill, driver's license, SSS, and passport, uh, since we do have our risk prevention rules in place. But uh, we have the PowerPay Plus portal. So if in case it would be the LGU to onboard their citizens into the GCash platform, we accept more than the, the general IDs. We accept 25 types of IDs through the portal. And for those without a smartphone, they can actually go to some of our uh, GCash partner outlets, like uh, Villarica, who do EKYC on the spot. Um, I do believe most of our constituents or citizens, they might not have a driver's license, for example, but they can get a barangay ID which is acceptable for Gcash. We follow a list of 25 acceptable IDs released by Banco Central for all banks and e-wallet service providers. So those are the options that they have should not have a smartphone. And you can actually still register to Gcash using a feature phone, yung basic na keypad. It's just a bit- And I suppose that's, yeah, that's also within the law of the national ID if you wanna add on to that, Attorney Ira. Yes. Yes, thank you, Ida. Um, it's precisely what I mentioned also towards the end of my presentation, that we're really yeah. trying to push for the national ID. Be not because of any political, ins you know, the, the, the issue is always very political. It's been pending for so many administrations, but really to be able to enable government to use digital technologies, we need to have a strong ID system. I always mention this whenever I do lectures. The last time I went to a bank, there was a two-pager list of IDs that they will accept for you to open an account. And my off, the question that often comes to me is, okay, I'll give you two of these IDs. Let's say my IBP card and my, my passport. Yeah. And then the bank will now say, oh, sir, I need proof of billing. I don't know why, but you said you needed to any two of these IDs yeah. because the data they need is not on my IDs that I presented. Right. They needed my billing address, right. which would have been in my driver's license. Right. So it, it, right. to really bring that all together to make things significantly more efficient is really to have a strong ID system. Uh, I, I mean, there are so many types of IDs that it became difficult to even use them. I was once using my IBP card, Integrated Bar of the Philippines, and they said, uh, sir, we don't accept bartenders' cards. And it's a joke, but really, it just comes out na parang sa sobra kasing dami ng classing ID. I don't expect them naman to recognize if IBP is for lawyers, PRC is for different types of professions. It really just has to... Kind of hit you. In a way, yeah. yeah, and that's why we need we only yeah. have one ID. But the one ID, I'm kind of hearing 
um, is this is a, this is supposed to be launched in September, right? Will the, the question is will the delay in the implementation of national ID will delay the November launch of the CBP? No, the no. central business uh, the portal. CBP, yeah, the CBP is operating independently. Um, we're still launching it as it is, and it will be more um, efficient once the ID comes out. Um, there are so many different aspects that we're working on to make the entire process more efficient, more streamlined, and really, at the end of the day, I think I can retire when I can say, hey, I, re I registered a corporation start to finish, and it was a pleasurable experience. <laughs> you know, there was no hassle whatsoever. And yeah. at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm done. It will happen we're one working day. through Arta. We're working, yes, through Arta. We're working with the Supreme Court to issue new rules on bringing um, notarizations online. We're working with other agencies with regards to KYC. Um, in fact, the I believe it was the Banco Central that issued relaxed rules on KYC as the pandemic started, which really yeah. helped both banks and the the e wallets to operate. Yeah. So. By adjusting these things at every step of the process, next thing you know, will be as good or even better than New Zealand three hours. Yeah. A lot of the digital platforms, um, the banks and including Gcash, they're only actually asking for one ID. Um, I think Mr. Bill wants, you want to comment something on this one, Mr. Bill? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, I was just gonna say with respect to standardization, the other thing that uh, we should have for, uh, to be standardized across the country is the use of the industry codes. Uh, even though they're supposed to be standardized, actually they're not. Uh, the industry codes are used slightly differently uh, across LGUs. And so that when you wanna capture, that's what Ira is trying to do in ARTA with a centralized uh, the CBP, uh, yeah. if you have a different code, you know, the same business might be running two or three different codes. They won't be able to get the central uh, business portal running. So let's standardize on the codes as well. Right. Thank you. Okay, I want to segue um, a bit to, let me see, um, Debbie and Janice, um, with your Connectayo, which is so valuable these days. I mean, not everyone, um, in fact, there's a lot of children. I, I missed the statistics. I was trying to Google it. I didn't find it. Um, a certain percentage of the students are still not enrolled simply because they cannot access Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi cannot be accessed simply of two things. One is the tower, and the other one is the affordability or access, accessibility. You've answered the accessibility part. What about the affordability part of it? How is Connectayo um, helping out in terms of affordability? And can you really, uh, do you have to have that tower before you can have the Connectayo facility in that area? Either you, Debbie or Janice? Yeah. Janice? You can go ahead, Debs. I'll answer the part on affordability. So th that's the reason why Connectio was um, launched. It's really for the DE market. So it's really the affordable Wi Fi. So currently, what we have right now in the market, when you want to have home internet, is a broadband or buying a uh, home prepaid Wi Fi. So that's a modem inside home that's prepaid. And you have to have, you have to buy the, the modem, which is, of course, um, expensive for the for this segment. Right. So the what we want is to have Wi-Fi installed in in these DE communities, so we are able to provide them stable internet and of course affordable. So as low as fifteen pesos, you can already connect to 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 the internet. Right. right. So Janice can answer on the towers. Yeah, and I, and I like that concept of tingi tingi, where you can buy mm. weekly basis. So that helps in the affordability. That is really yes, because um, currently the pain point is they 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 have peace on it um, in in these yeah. areas. But in terms of of uh, uh, connectivity or even the speed, it's really slow. What we want is to have that stable internet in the area. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Janice, so, do you want to add something on that one? Yes, you had a question on the towers. Tower, yes. I have already explained accessibility, but then um, we are not the, well, the technology of community Wi-Fi is not just dependent on the towers. So yeah. it's also on the fiber and whatever connectivity. Oh, excellent. 
that is available, then we can serve the community. Can, can you repeat that again? Whatever connectivity in the area? Uh, yes, because there's a lot, right? Like you can get it from wirelessly from a tower. If we have fiber, we use fiber for right. for So that's right. why it's okay. more to Debbie's point. Um, there are PISO Wi-Fi's in these communities, but then they're using BSL Wi-Fi's. I don't, I don't know if um, if that's true, but then uh, it's um, consumer grade. And what we are using as a backhaul or as a bandwidth for these um, access points or for the community Wi-Fi mm -hmm. is fiber if we have it readily available in those communities. All right. I, I Oh, Jan sorry, Janice, I, I have a question. I have a question either for Janice. Okay. So, in terms of the installation, uh, are you just installing those routers on an existing lamppost or against a, a rooftop of a building or the wall of a building? I mean, you don't need to build a full tower, right? You're just putting the. Oh, you're no. just installing a router somewhere. Is that right? Yes, we install it um, on poles, just like what I've explained a while ago. And we are partnering with a lot of LGUs for this because we just cannot install it like just install it like that, right? So um, we are partnering with LGUs here um, in the Philippines. Uh, we're also doing uh, partnerships with the electric co-ops, especially in the prov in the provinces. Mm -hmm. So that's how we um, deploy. Sorry, yeah, this this may be a question, but what's the kilometer radius coverage of that router? Huh. How uh, many routers? Do you Yes, I know. Because usually in your homes, it's like how many meters away lang. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, for us, we design it in paper. So, you know, in paper, it's usually 300 meter of radius. But when we design it, it's only 50 meter radius. So when you see um, an implementation of community Wi-Fi, it's uh, depending, depending on the poles, and the design so parang it will be every five houses maybe on a oh, right. yeah. yeah but, but Ida, Ida, yes. if, it's, yeah. if it's inexpensive uh it's a good yes. investment for an lgu to put up because sure. then all the yep. people in in its uh poor communities will have wi-fi i mean i, I think exactly. it, without yeah, having to exactly. put the tower it would be much faster to install yeah there's actually exactly. no for the LGUs, so we partner with them um, to build and um, provide Wi-Fi for these communities. So it's Globe who spends for for this equipment. We just need their support and their approval for us to install this. Okay, yeah, no, that's right. The product. Yeah. All right. I had, I need to um, go through some of this Q and A. Uh, the, questions under the Q&A. Um, uh, this is, I think, is it for information? I think it's because it's quote unquote. One of the information needed by the Philippine ID system is address, but we do not have a national address standard yet. It will be difficult to locate individuals without the standard address. In fact, address is needed in most transactions with the government. So it will be great that if this is standardized. One city is standardizing its address, that's Makati. The city issued an ordinance related to this. The mandate for regulating this is with the Sangunian according to the local government code. Um, Attorney Ira, maybe you can uh, comment on this? Absolutely Not agree. A sta standardized um, object. Yeah, that's, that's the difficulty that we face um, given all the autonomy, as I mentioned, that is given throughout the governance government system. Um, we have to remember this is a constitution that was pretty much a reaction to um, a lot of the issues of the previous constitution and they really provided um, measures to address these and some of them quite um, at least based on my opinion are now antiquated in line of 2020. Um, absolutely I agree that we should standardize at the very least the fee structures for LGUs, um, to get them to the industry classifications, address systems. Um, think of it this way. A Sangunian can address these concerns with regards to uniformity of um, the addresses or the labeling within their sectors. But then again, Congress can also rename public schools, public hospitals, and roads. 
So there's really that that massive disconnect that we have to address, and um, mm-hmm. that's not under something I can personally, um, you know, help out in through Arta. But at least as a private lawyer, I can be more than happy to help all these branches of government. But it goes down to what can we do for now? And for now, we can at least do it on a per city basis, like Makati. I'm very happy to hear that they are creating things in a more unified state. If we can create the example for the rest of the country, let's say the number of cities in NCR, that is a massive um, achievement, 25 million people are in the NCR. And that will serve as the example for the rest of the country. Because really, we're trying to push for so many things, economic decentralization, bringing things back to the provinces, but everybody wants to do business in the NCR. And at that point, it's perfect for the NCR region to really set the example for the rest of the country. Thanks. Okay, some of the questions here under the Q&A um, have actually been answered, such as the the far-flung areas that's um, answered by Conectayo at, at this point, no? internet access is challenged. Um, comment by um, Delia Hostev here, government agencies are required to streamline processes and make sure that in time of pandemic, their clientele are not unduly exposed. I think this is just a uh, basic comment. Um, there's a comment here about the data privacy. Though I, I heard in your presentation, again, it's for you, Attorney Ira, um, it says here data privacy law applies to individual uh, business sector, but not the corporation. So, but, but you did mention that, that data privacy is not applicable when it comes to the government transactions that you've um, explained a little while ago, right? Yes, absolutely. Even before the Data Privacy Act was um, <clears throat> signed, made into law, and even implemented, the corporate information, for instance, that is filed with the SEC, the taxpayer information that's filed with the BIR, that's, those are all public records. In fact, so many years ago, we would know that um, Senator Pacquiao was the highest taxpayer of the country, this and that. So that's not a data privacy issue because these are government records that are public records. What data privacy, uh, the Data Privacy Act is trying to address is personal information or sensitive personal information that um, should be protected by the government agency. So I, I, was, I actually saw that question all. Yeah. So, so earlier in the Q&A and I, government agencies should not think that because of data privacy, they cannot share information among themselves because that will really destroy the whole um, yeah. concept, concept of e-governance with the private sector. Yes. Um, so- that would say that you cannot use a courier because you will give him the address of the citizen. That's not going to work. In fact, and thankfully, the National Privacy Commission already said, as long as it's a legitimate governmental purpose, you can share, just have a data sharing agreement. Okay. Um, Attorney Ahara, before you, you uh, leave there, just leave your, um, your uh, what's this, microphone unmute. Um, because this is between you and attorney Malaya on the question of um, uh, when it comes to, you did mention 2021 um, is a target date because in, it was signed in 2018. Um, this is now on the question of um, that expectation is on an end-to-end, end-to-end digitalization, I suppose. Uh, but what we're seeing, um, attorney Malaya, is we are seeing partly digital and partly manual. Um, Digital in terms of payment. And by the way, congratulations, Attorney Malaya. I can vouch you can complete mayor's permit barangay in less than two days. It's probably one. I made a mistake on one transaction. So I did a shadow shopping personally with Paranaque. And I want to congratulate the team of Paranaque. Even though it's partly manual, it was very effective. Though I, for improvement, it would have been nice if everything's digital. Are we going to expect that and when? Yes, uh, for the part of, and thank you very much, Ms. Ida, no, for that compliment. Uh, and uh, on the part that it's partly manual, we are working on it. And uh, uh, very soon, no? very soon, uh, we will have uh, uh, 
uh, Paymaya as our uh, online uh, part, uh, payment partner. So if it's September, maybe by uh, October, first week of October, we will uh, roll it out, the online payments. So we'll be end to end. And also aside from the online payment, as I've said earlier, we are going to issue uh, EORs and uh, eventually uh, e-permits. And uh, well, what about the application uh, online? And everything online, scanned, sent, application online. Yes. Do we expect that? Yes, actually we have that uh, facility, but currently our uh, website is uh, undergoing maintenance because uh, we are upgrading it uh, to link with DTI. Uh, we uh, sign a MOA with DTI, we're in all uh, uh, BN applicants, uh, business name applicants, uh, can be pushed to our uh, website. So we are now, we will be uh, interconnected with uh, DTI. That's for a single proprietorship, no? And uh, for the e uh, central business portal of the ARTA, Paranaque is also on board. So we expect to be uh, uh, linked with the central business portal yeah. soon. This is all excellent, excellent news, I tell you. Um, I, I, it, it's a bit of a pity we don't have BIR representative here. So it could have actually completed the, trans the whole transaction, so to speak. Um, Debbie and, and Janice, there's a, a comment or question here, and it's in, in caps, in bold. Um, in some geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas where there's no mobile phone signal, will there be any other version of Connectayo? Should I continue? Do you have any other technical facilities or measures that will allow masses in several fifth and six class municipality far flung studios to connect to this community Wi Fi. I seem to recall that there are community based telecommunication systems that have been established where communities are issued SIM cards that they can use to communicate with one another in that locality. I hope you can expound on this. Okay, let me answer the first one regarding um, if we can. Uh, deploy in areas which you know there is no uh, mobile signal uh, okay part of our roadmap is to provide this because as you know part of the user experience was for us for well for the subscriber to receive a code right so at least kahit lang one bar of signal sana meron but um Yes, we can definitely deploy in these areas. As I've said, it has to be densely um, populated, these communities. It cannot be like one kilometer away yung bawat bahay, di ba? It's like placing one pole in each of their houses, right? So, so, so um, and in most of the provinces, not like that. It's, you know, it's not really dense, there, the houses. So, community Wi-Fi works in dense housing so that's why we are prioritizing that for now okay. uh, we want to go nationwide with the help of the lgus so we'll prioritize muna that one and then we'll we'll after yeah. this, we go to my next phase on the other locations that will be needing pa more na you know maybe we have another solution for these areas that uh, need internet connectivity Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Just moving on, um, uh, unless uh, Debbie would want to add on to that one. I just want to add on because uh, the, the issue there in the area, if, it, if the issue is mobile connectivity, then Globe is also addressing that. Um, we're installing cell sites all over the, the Philippines to really reach all of our customers. So that's also part of the plan, but that is a different uh, plan versus Connectio. So Connectio is really focused on the DE areas where we have the, the mobile signal. Right, right. So there's another area um, within the group of, of GLOBE uh, looking after this, no? Yes. Oh, thank you. All right, there's a comment here. Real estate, real estate tax payment is fast approaching and 60% of those paying are seniors who are not allowed to go out for health reasons. Please, LGU. Can LGUs put up cashless payment schemes 
or arrangements by December 2020. I'm not sure who can actually answer this. I think it's the, the mayors here uh, with us today. But um, who would want to take a hit on this question? Because it's more of cash. Because as far as GCash is concerned, yeah, you're ready as long as the LG is ready. Yes, we can. What expand, Raquel? We would just need the support by or from the LGUs for this type of engagement. But yes, uh, it would be easy for us to put up uh, GCash wallets or QR codes or even for online payments acceptance for them. So if there are other LGUs or any LGUs interested, just uh, reach out to us and we would be glad to engage with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. The moderator mentioned that BIR needs help. Please elaborate. So I guess I'm the one answering this. I actually did register um, from end to end to register a, a, a business. And um, I did that for the sole purpose of checking the ease of doing business. And I find um, BIR, in fairness, very courteous. I give them 10 out of 10. I find um, them um, uh, uh, very efficient. Uh, though um, still needs a lot of improvement when it comes to doing things uh, less manual, particularly having the, the books. You literally have to buy um, ledgers and journals. And I thought, well, you know, I studied accounting. That was years ago. Last time I saw those were, were years ago. And I asked, um, can't I make an arrangement to have an approval on the uh, you know, doing this um, through the computer system. So I think that's, that's the part when I said BIR needs help. But when I saw Ginger's presentation, I thought, well, this is it. It can actually help out. Um, BIR did a hack attacks and, and I'm hoping um, a little bit more digital when it comes to the micro, small, medium enterprise. Ginger, do you want to add on? Yeah, uh, Ida, no? uh, we've been very happy naman, with the BIR. They they seem to be open to digitize a lot of things. So yeah, they did a hack attacks and uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of changes siguro, in terms right. of like digitizing a lot of stuff. But you're correct. Um, there's such a thing as a loose leaf accreditation. So you can actually have the system that you use accredited so that you, you no longer have to write on your books because by law, it's still says that it had it, um it needs to be handwritten so but with loose leaf you can actually do that have the cast accredited yeah yeah I'll, I'll connect to you on this one i want to learn more just to ensure that um it does help uh, when it comes to micro small medium enterprise which is one of my advocacies as well okay um another comment or question once during one of our meetings a concern was raised that the establishment of peace on nets affects the mobile SIM signal and even the speed of the internet connection. Is this true? If it is, do LGUs need to enact regulatory measures to regulate establishments of PSONETs? So I guess this is back to uh, what, Connectayo to, to answer this, or maybe this is yours, Bill? Okay, if none, um, we'll answer this um, eventually. Um, okay, but be before I wrap up, um, Attorney Ira, you do want to say a couple of things. Uh, two things you mentioned, if you can just uh, make a mention of this before you go, or have we lost Attorney Ira? Hi. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so go to just last um, words on my part. I, I, I don't want to take too much time, but. I agree with you first that the BIR is doing very well. That's why I included that in my presentation, that they actually have more digital payments and digital filings than, than they did manual. They also have, and this is what ARTA is here for as well, all these government agencies, BIR included, has to operate within their policies and their mandates. And one of the things we're helping them with, because it really is counterproductive to going digital, is their policy that if I'm going to register a business, the payment, which is only 500 pesos, has to be received by the regional, the cashier of the revenue district office there where the business will operate. That destroys the whole online centralized business registration. 
And they recognize that and they're working with us on that. So it's really a policy measure. Um, the second thing I wanted to raise, uh, Ms. Ginger mentioned earlier that there is really a difficulty for um, those who want to do business to know what is required of them. And that's absolutely true. They don't know where to begin. Um, I didn't mention this in the presentation because of lack of time, but there is a Philippine business registration information system being developed by ARTA, which is called PIBRIS. And effectively and eventually what it will do is... Um, what is the type of business you want to get into? Okay, where? Okay, click, 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 click. Sige. Um, consulting, go to this, do this, do this, provide this, get this, all the way down to the LGU level. Because that is where business registration varies all throughout. That types of business. The permits and the ancillary licenses for mining are completely different from an accounting firm. And there is really no registration portal that really tells you, ah, okay, if that's all you're trying to do, then do this. And these are all you need. Um, that is another one of the projects of um, ARTA and we're really pushing for it. Uh, final words again, ARTA is here to help. We're happy to have been here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, our role here is really to help other government agencies go digital, be streamlined, be more efficient. We are changing not only policies or technologies, but actually even a large segment is human behavior. And um, the, the, I think again, it is the perfect time to do so, to go digital because the, the acceptance of our citizenry of things that are digital. Um, just yesterday, I, I hosted a webinar for ARTA with the government of Moldova. And one of their main uh, aspects that led to their success of e-governance was they mandated paperless transactions all throughout government. Yeah. And that forced people to now go digital. Yeah. So really, it's, it's changing policies, it's using the yeah. best technologies of the time, and it's changing human behavior. Yeah. Um, all those inputs... It's normally the shortcut way of pushing everyone to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. But again, our problem also is th their governmental system is different from ours and all the autonomous um, aspects of different agencies and different levels of the LGUs have to be worked with. So we're just adopting that, but we're respecting their autonomies as well. Thank you, Attorney Aida. So, thank you. Um, we've run out of time, but I still want to get final words from Attorney Melanie Malaya, please. Um, if we can, if okay with you, um, a minute or two for your final words. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Zida, no? and I would like to thank uh, the Liva Wasitas Challenge for inviting us here. And uh, for the LGUs who want to benchmark the city of Paranaque, who wants uh, to have a copy of ordinances or the templates for whatever, we are willing and uh, always uh, here to uh, be of assistance to all of you. Uh, you can uh, email nablofilippines at gmail.com or email me personally at melanie.malaya at uh, bplo.paranake.com. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And um, just to recap, we did invite here both the public and private sectors because we believe that the cooperation between the public and the private sectors following the requirements, not just requirements of ARTA um, and the ease of doing business, but it does make sense to do things digitally. So let me close by thanking our speakers and panelists for their insights and thoughts. Before we end, kindly note, we will try to answer all the unanswered questions. In addition, may I invite participants to answer the feedback form that will appear once you exit this webinar. For those who wish to receive certificate of participation, please fill out back form with your name as you wish to appear on the certificate. For those of you in Zoom, the feedback form will appear on your screens when you exit. For those watching Facebook, please take a picture of the QR code on your screen to receive the feedback form. Copies of all presentations will be sent to you via email. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today's <laughs> session. We look forward to seeing you at our next lab, which is gonna be on October 7th and we will be discussing
mobility. Thank you so much. This is from your Livable Cities Challenge. Thank you. Um, can the panel stay a little bit? We'll just have photo shoot, a photo op. Sure. 